Just so, like I said, so we can have a common vocabulary so we can talk about our experiences a little bit better. Okay. So if there are two separate things going on here, us and the extended world through the body, there are basically four different relationships we can have. Okay? We can have detachment, synchronization, coordination, and unification of soul, body, and world. Okay? That's what is permissible to us. In order to test those, in order to actually measure those four different potential states, we will take a look at the, at the brainwave patterns. We've looked at this once before. Delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay? Delta is slow wave sleep. Theta is dreaming. Alpha is the synchronized low energy meditative or hypnotic state. Uh, beta is your normal everyday unsynchronized waking state or a synchronized coordinated waking state which the um, which the Buddhists call the fair witness state all right which is the same state that Descartes achieved through his uh, application of methodical fact he was at the end of his eight years of meditation he was walking around in a fair witness state so he had accomplished exactly the same thing as the meditators had. All right, just simply by you know concentrating on, on his uh, method. And then gamma is a synchronized high energy active meditator or hypnotic state, typically found in athletic activities. So those those are the ways that we'll measure this, these four things. So if there are two distinct but interactive substances, then the two substances can be detached from one another. For example, in the theta state. Okay, the two substances can be synchronized with one another in the alpha state. The two substances can be coordinated with one another in the beta state. And they can be unified with one another in the gamma state. All right, so we go from a total detachment here where mind and body are falling off completely. And consciousness has no relationship to the extended world. All right, to where they're synchronized, they're both back together and they're synchronized together to where they're coordinated as we move around in the fair witness state, and finally to where they're unified at this point where consciousness falls off and it is pure, physical, extended reality. Because at this point when we're in that extended, in that high level, high energy gamma state, we're not thinking about anything. It is pure body. It is pure extension. Okay, and any athlete who's had that experience, you know, the, 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 the zone, uh, knows what I'm talking about. We don't have to think. And we can even take a look at it. I mean, if, if, because basically what happens is if we're, if we're interacting and making decisions, what happens is we set up feedback loops and control cycles inside of the nervous system itself, and those take time. Now, if the body is simply responding to external stimuli, it can respond in 15 milliseconds, 15 thousandths of a second, from the time it gets the, it gets the perception of whatever's going on to the time it takes the appropriate action. So 15 milliseconds is not fast for a computer, but it is fast for us, okay, in the normal world, you know, the normal extended world. So as long as we are in this unified gamma state, the response time is 15 milliseconds for whatever it is we're doing. Hitting a racquetball, catching, you know, catching a football pass, hitting a golf swing, you know, sinking a ball in, ba in basketball, whatever, tennis, you know, we're there 15 milliseconds and it's effortless and it's the flow state. If we start to interact with it, if we start to interfere with it, if we bring ourselves back into the equation, what will happen is we will extend that response time by as much as a thousand times because we can actually see that if we start to really you know, mess things up, what will happen is we will get response times of 1,500 milliseconds, a second and a half, and that's when everything falls apart. This is that old uh, joke about the, you know, the, the centipede that was doing fine until it tried to keep track of which legs were going in which order, at which point it just stopped. <laughs> okay? So we can go from detachment, where it is pure mind and no extended substance, all the way to unification, where it is pure extended substance and no mind. Just the consciousness being there with the body. But the experience is pure body. All right? So the methods, 
This is methodical detachment, synchronization, coordination, and unification. Methods of detachment, seated meditation, hypnosis, and awakening theta state following from a synchronized alpha state. High level meditators, meditators who practiced an average of 30 or 40 years, actually have a waking state that is theta, very low wave. Uh, you know, three to three to seven cycles, four to seven cycles. Very low. That I mean, they are they are constantly in that that theta state, and it's it's their their experience therefore is very different than the normal person running around doing everything in a you know an uncoordinated theta state. The one we're normal. Okay, so the the nervous system can literally be trained. Methods of synchronization, the alpha state, yoga, seated meditation, and hypnosis. But they're synchronized. This is the coherent, synchronized state that we get from, uh, the, from the resonant breathing, for example. Okay? Methods of coordination, tai chi, martial arts, athletics, gymnastics, walking meditation, golf, those kinds of things. Those will help to coordinate and synchronize everything. All right? And methods of unification in the gamma state, Tai Chi, again, martial arts, athletics, walking meditation, um, high energy state, it breathes. This is that classic description out of the Zen literature, especially like Eugen Herigl's Zen in the Art of Archery. Okay? The archer, you know, it shoots. It draws the bow. It notches everything. It does it. It. This. Okay, and they're not involved in anything except watching it, except experiencing it. And they're not making any decisions about anything. And so that is the high level unification of, of mind and body here, okay, at the, at the gamma level. And so again, a high level, you know, uh, uh, result of, of practice in meditation, practice in active meditation, like walking or archery or. Tea ceremony, whatever. All of these things were designed to be able to do this, you know, in the real world, doing active things rather than just while you were seated in meditation. Okay, so we can methodically alter the relationship, and hypnosis is one way that we do that. All right, what should we call the two elements of our experience? So we have a common vocabulary, so we can describe what it is that we're doing. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> All right. So let's call the thing that we are, the soul, the race, Kajitans, myself, me. Okay. So that, we'll just refer to it as me. I, you know, me. I'm doing this. Perceptible objects are the extended universe, and all the perceptible objects out there. And the body, which is a special case of an extended substance, we will call an avatar. Okay? Has everyone seen the movie? Yeah. Avatar? Okay? He didn't make that up. Okay? This is an old, old, old Sanskrit term. Very old. And notice what the movie is about. It is about the remote operation of a physical, mechanical object, very high level, by a person who is encased in a control module. So again, consciousness interacting with a detached form and experiencing and directing everything that that form does. Okay, in this case, it's a mechanical, you know, it's an electromechanical thing. In our case, it's this. Okay, the classical definition of an avatar described, derived, sorry, from the Sanskrit word avatar, meaning descent. The deliberate descent of a deity into the extended universe of four-dimensional space-time. Okay, it also refers to the body of such a deity, which the deity uses for the duration of its descent into matter. So the avatar is the process of descent, and it is the physical body that the deity takes during its you know, time period. Who is the most famous of all avatars in the Western world? Jesus. Yes. Jesus Christ. In fact, that is what the Jesus mythos is all about. He is a Western avatar. God descended into a physical form to demonstrate to the rest of us what we are. Because we're exactly like him. What's that? We were created in the image of God. 
Jesus Yes, exactly. Exactly. And so everything that Jesus did, to use the Christian mythos, we do too. Okay? And so that is what all of the, that is what the original, the, the ancient Christian um, doctrine was all about, was emulating Jesus. Okay? The imitatio Christi, the imitation of Christ. So what we did was we, we took this symbol, symbolic creation of this avatar, okay, the descent of the deity into this physical form, and we now mimic everything that that avatar does. And we come to the realization that we are identical with that deity and that avatar. Okay? So this is our avatar, custom made just for us. Okay? No one else has one just like it. Okay? And it is ours to do with as we wish. To learn what it is to be a disembodied, non-local, non-corporeal you know, substance. Here, okay? This is the Adam and Eve myth. Alright? They're hanging out in the garden. Everything's wonderful and cool, but really dull. Very boring. Alright, so here comes the serpent, the most wisest of all creatures. <laughs> the wisest of all creatures. It walks in, by the way. It has legs. Um, and it goes up to Eve and says, hey, I understand you're bored. <laughs> he says, yeah, you know, we've been here for how, we don't even know how long we've been here. Everything's the same. You know, the food's the same, the entertainment's the same, Adam's the same, everything's the same. I'm getting bored. <laughs> So he says, well, why don't you go eat that tree over there? You know, eat that fruit over there. She said, well, we were told not to. The gods told us not to. Elohim, plural, gods, in the original. Okay? And uh, the serpent says, do you know why they told you not to eat that particular fruit? And Eve says, no. You know, I didn't ask. And so the serpent says, because if you eat that particular fruit, you will become just like them. Now, wouldn't that be neat? She says, yeah, I bet I wouldn't be bored then. So she goes and tells Adam what the serpents told her, and he reluctantly agrees, okay, because he's, you know, not as adventurous as he is. Uh, but he loves her, and so he says, all right, we'll go for it. So they both eat of the, of the tree, and bingo, all sorts of things happen. They're no longer bored, and they are kicked out into this inhospitable place where they have to learn what? What was, what was, what was, what's the name of the tree? The tree yes, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what we're here to do according to the, you know, according to this particular myth. That's what we're here to do. And the way we do that is by learning the difference between what we are and this, and then learning to master this by, by the, you know, by the four different relationships that we can have with it. Uh, and then by making ethical and moral decisions based upon our new understanding of the nature of reality. Okay? So that, that's what this is all about. That's what the Adam and Eve myth was essentially trying to convey, uh, was their understanding, of, you know, giving a purpose to all of the seemingly um, endless and meaningless and uh, random, you know, pain and suffering that we encounter. So they were trying to give it a meaning, they were trying to give it a purpose, and they were saying, this is the purpose. We will become exactly like the gods, the God, by our experiences here, learning the difference between good and evil. So that's what, so, so we now have an avatar that is our very own, we can now play with. Okay? Keeping it healthy, you know, when it, when it does suffer, learning how to deal with that suffering so that it can get back to being healthy again. All of these kinds of things. All right? Any questions about that before we move on to the topic? Okay, so that, um, uh, today, today we're going to talk about hypnotic skill sets. Uh, Milton A. Jerickson, who, if you recall from the first seminar, is the, undoubtedly, the greatest hypnotist the world has ever seen. Okay? Without that, I mean, he, he just, he lived and breathed hypnosis and he knew what he was doing. And he developed all of these new techniques and he developed all of these new models and he developed all of these new practices 
and he was just something to behold. Anybody who's seen him on the video, um, it just marvels at the complexity of what he is doing. Master communicator. So anyway, he, um, um, oh, not, not Erickson, he, people who have studied Erickson realized that he divided hypnotic phenomena into 15 hypnotic skills. Okay, he combined into five hypnotic skill sets. So the skill sets are memory functions, so there are certain skills that allow us to, mod, uh, to manipulate our memory functions, time distortions, dualistic experiences, that is to have dualistic experiences, dissociated movements, and modifications of perception. So the, those are the five skill sets. Now let's take a look at the actual um, skills. So in skill set one, there are three memory functions. We can produce states of amnesia. We can tell the avatar to forget things. That's what hypnosis is. Hypnosis is us giving instructions to the avatar. And it carries those instructions out because it is imminently programmable. All right? We can hypermnesia, which is remembering things that we have forgotten, so the opposite of amnesia, and post-hypnotic suggestions, which is carrying out activities or behaviors at some later time in response to a specific cue. All right? So those are the things we can do to modify our memory functions. Skill set number two, three time distortions. We can uh, have time expansion or contraction. Now we've experienced all of that. When we were really, really young and very bored, time seemed to like go on forever and ever. You know, 15 minutes was like, uh, all right? Uh, but if we were with our friends, time would go very rapid. So the way that we perceive the flow of time is regulated by hypnotic phenomena. All right, age regression. We can actually take ourselves back to a previous time in our experience, and we can, to a large extent, recover, if they're not direct memories, at least memory experiences. Whether they're you know, uh, verifiable memories or not is not the point. They are experiences which seem to come from that particular time in our lives. Okay, so they have a psychological validity, even if they're not uh, true memories, you know, like, like a videotape would have a memory. And finally, future progression, we can actually put ourselves into a future situation and imagine what that situation would be like, and we can live it. Now, the level of skill that we bring to all of this uh, determines the actual level of experience that we have. The more we practice, the more skilled we become. The more skilled we become, the more real these kinds of experiences feel. Okay, again, it's a matter of discipline and practice. That's all it is. Very simple. Skill set number three is dualistic experiences. Dissociation, which we've already talked about, that is literally taking, you know, taking the consciousness and removing it from the avatar and having the avatar, you know, not registering it, those kinds of things. And finally, hypnotic dreaming and daydreaming. Right? We can induce hypnotic dreams, and we can induce hypnotic dangers. <coughs> Which, during the dreaming and daydreaming cycle, when we were kids and we were daydreaming in school, we lost total track of what was going on in the classroom. <laughs> okay? So that's the dissociation part of it. We dissociated ourselves from the actual external reality. Uh, skill set four, we have three dissociated movements that we can program. One is catalepsy, which is rigid, mo rigid, you know, holding muscles and parts of the body rigid. Arm levitation, okay, which is a, a classic one, video motor movement, and finally automatic writing and drawing. We can actually have, you know, one or both hands out here writing words or drawing pictures while we're talking or watching TV or whatever. And it's completely dissociated from what we are doing. And finally, skill set number five, where there are four ways of modifying perception. Anesthesia and analgesia, which we're very interested in. Hyperesthesia, which is um, enhancing sensations. Okay, so enhancing sensations of bliss and anesthetizing sensations of pain or discomfort. Positive hallucinations are seeing, having the visual or auditory experience or kinesthetic experience of things that aren't really there. That's a positive hallucination. 
and negative hallucinations are having the, you know, having some parts of our um, uh, of the real external world out there vanish from our perceptions. Now, at some level, the avatar always keeps track of that. So, for example, if if we were to negatively hallucinate this row of chairs and then we were to get up and walk around the room, none of us would trip over these chairs. We would not see them. They would be absent from our actual perception, but the avatar knows they're there, and so it would walk around them. We wouldn't know why it was walking around them, but it would. Okay? So it knows what's going on. It always keeps track of everything that happens. Um, but our perception, our experience, is modified by the instructions. Okay. Any questions about that? Yeah. You said um, future happening. Future progression. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So you could have this future prediction, and then when it came true, I mean. When, when the time arrives, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then would you follow what you perceived was going to happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If if that was what you wanted to program in. Usually what we do in that case is we try, to, we try to build in a lot of creativity and a lot of options, okay? So we're not rigid, we don't want to be, we don't want, because we don't know what's really going to happen, okay? The real world out there is kind of random. So we really, we really want to make certain that we have options available to us, um, you know, and, let, and, and, and do all of that stuff. Um, but it is possible to have the avatar actually run through a sequence of, of events, very complex events, while we're off thinking of something else. It is possible to program that in. All right, we have that all the time when we're driving. We can leave home, we can actually you know, get the keys, leave the house, get in the car, start the car, back up, drive to where we're going, navigate through all the traffic, get to where we're going, walk into wherever we're supposed to be, and have no memory of anything that happened from the time we left. Okay? Yeah. The, av the avatar is doing fine, because it knows how to drive, and it knows how to yes. navigate, yeah. and it knows where to go, and it knows to stop at the red light, and it knows that this guy over here is going to run into it, so it stops. And, you know, all of that stuff happens. We've had that experience a million times. Okay, this another example of how you know we can be off doing our own thing, us, the thinking substance which we are, while the avatar is fully engaged in the actual extended world. Very intelligent. This thing is really smart and very well trained. We've trained it well to do complex operations in this very complex environment. Okay? And if we need to be there, if it needs us, it will call us back. <laughs> okay? So that happens a lot. That, that happens a whole bunch of times. The daydreaming example. You now, this dissociation happens all the time. And the avatar seems to do just fine. So this is the level of control that we have. This is the level of input that we have to this incredibly complex, you know, bioelectrical, biomechanical, you know, machine that, that we have available to us. Uh, we don't even, I mean, you know, as, as much as we have reverse engineered it, we still really don't understand how it operates. We've got a lot of moving parts in there, about 30 trillion of them, okay, cellular level. If we drop down to the molecular level, you know, that's going to expand infinitely. If we drop down to the quantum level, you know, the numbers begin to expand exponentially. So lots of moving parts that we do not control. We have no idea how it digests our food. Okay? We have no idea how it, um, you know, how, how it manipulates the arm. I just want it to manipulate the arm, and it does this. Because we learned that a long, long time ago, to trial and error. And so now that's a, that is a program that is controlled by the cerebellum back here. It is a fixed program. We don't have to even think about it. Seamless, just move it, you know. And it does all of these mechanical things without us even thinking about it. And it will even take control of, of the muscles and do things to protect us, like slamming on the brakes when there's something that happens. 
We're not even aware of it. We don't even know something's happened until it's over with, and we're looking at it saying, wow, why did I stop? Oh, that's why I stopped. <laughs> yeah. Are there instances of uh, people, like if they're really badly abused, mm -hmm. going into the avatar state and just staying there? They do not go into the avatar state. They dissociate completely. Okay. So what we have then, okay, in the case of like, for example, if we want, if we are, if we are in the Central Intelligence Agency and we want to create an assassin, okay, let's let's be a little less dramatic. If we want to create a courier, okay, who does not know that they're a courier, that is, they have no idea that they're carrying back and forth these messages. What we do is, um, if we're you know if we're if we're being really nasty about it, we will subject them to electroshock, chemical seizures, all sorts of things that will literally break up their nervous system and force them to evacuate, force the consciousness that they are to leave. And then the avatar is wide open and we can go back and reprogram. So what happens is the avatar then acts on its own according to the program instructions. And the person has no access to that because they have been shut out. So there are gaps in their memory, large gaps. Now we have firsthand um, testimony from several of these couriers that were created during the MK Ultra program. Most of them were um, actresses, actors, people who have a reason to be in other countries, you know, doing odd things. <laughs> All right, and so they would be programmed to take messages, you know, verbal messages, from their controller to whoever they wanted to. So they would go over to Budapest, let's say, and they would be making a movie over there, and sometime they would have a controller over there who would give them the proper command signal, and they would leave the set, go deliver their message, come back to the set, resume what they were doing, and have absolutely no memory whatsoever of what they just did. Not even recoverable, you know, by normal hypnotic means. You'd have to know exactly how they were programmed in order to get that memory back. Mm -hmm. So this thing, like I said, is infinitely programmable. And we are, you know, if we're locked out of the programming sequence, then we really don't have any access to, you know, to the whole thing that's going on. And they've discovered that through, you know, through intense trauma, starting when they're very young, when they're, you know, not even born yet, they can create multiple personalities, multiple altered personalities, alt altered ego, alters. And those will all be programmed to do specific things under specific circumstances with specific people under specific commands. You know, the That's potential. scary stuff. It is very scary stuff. Yeah, when you start to look at the dark side of this, it gets, uh, it, it gets weird and it gets scary. Yeah, and it gets very bad. Uh, very, uh, um, evil. <laughs> well, yeah, we're talking very evil. And so, but yeah, so, but it does, it does demonstrate the flexibility and the power of this avatar. This thing is, is incredible. Okay? Um, so as we learn how to interface with it more effectively, uh, specifically here we're going to learn how to, you know, moderate the feelings of pain and create feelings of bliss, that's what we're going to be doing. Um, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Is this like when, when they're walking on coals? Is that the same type of thing? Partially. Partially. The fakirs who developed all of these kinds of things uh, practiced yoga, practiced meditation, practiced all of these kinds of things and had uh, very serious training in all of these kinds of things. Like, for example, they have the classic thing where the fakir will lay on a bed of nails. It actually hurts, it actually penetrates the skin, it actually causes blood. Uh, but because they have, they have been able to dissociate, they are able to lie on the bed of names. They're able to be buried because they can lower their metabolism and not be scared to death because they're buried. Uh, they can walk rapidly across a specific kind of coal. Uh, you couldn't do it like taking coal out of your, uh, your coal-burning stove and make a big barbecue pit with that stuff, that would incinerate anybody who tried to walk through it. There's a specific kind of coal that as it heats, it creates this ash, builds up on the outside of it, and it's non-conductive. 
So yes, it is, I mean, the temperature right above the cold is you know, 1,500, 2,000 degrees. But if you walk across fast enough and don't stumble and don't lose your focus, you'll be, you'll be touching very rapidly on this, on this uh, uh, non-conductive surface around the actual burning coal, and you'll be okay. If you slow down or if you lose your mind, you know, if you lose your focus or anything, then it can be bad. And in fact, you know, Tony Robbins, you know, has made this a centerpiece of his uh, sideshow forever and ever. And every time he does it, somebody gets hurt. And in fact, he just had, you know, several people who got hurt the last week. So, but you sign waivers and you sign this, you know, you know, so everybody knows what's coming up in the camp. So it's part, partially concentration, partially focus, but also partially the special cult. So it's, it's not as dangerous as it appears, but it is dangerous. Yeah. Well, a large part of this is physical. My college just recently did this. Yeah. And even people who didn't believe could walk across the Yeah, exactly, the coast. exactly. Yeah, they exactly. had nothing up there helping them. You yeah, just, nothing. You can do it because yeah. there's moisture in there. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Extend, extend the pit, you know, make it five times as long, yeah. wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. It has to be exactly the right length, exactly the right width, exactly the right depth with these special kinds of cold. Okay, so it is, you know, parlor tricks. It's, you know, it's a con game in that case. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, effective. It's an effective con. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but the parkiers can actually, you know, they can actually be there. We, we've seen, um, like David Blake, you know, we've seen him be suspended, you know, on a block of ice. We've seen him, you know, you know set the world record for for being inside of a water-filled container. Uh, you know, we've seen him do all of these things because he's learned these techniques and he's, he's, he's uh, learned from the best, learned from the people who do this. So we've actually seen that, you know, live in person. I, I actually saw him in, in Times Square when he was suspended. That was impressive. I went down there to see that just to make sure that there was no chicanery going on. And he really was there, suspended above the street. and so. You know, he, he practices this kind of stuff, and he learns from the best. Okay? Anything else? Yeah. In the sense, when you're given a, like a placebo, mm -hmm. and, you're, and, and they tell you this is the miracle drug, or this is the, or like this, you're basically hypnotizing yourself, aren't you? Just yes. Yeah. Uh, we would... Um, you're the, telling the avatar, this is good for you, this will yes. take care of it. Yes. And then you take it, and, and it actually yeah. modifies its internal structure to accommodate the expectation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was a, yeah, there was a big study on the placebo effect back in 1959, a huge study. And they, they discovered that somewhere between like, you know, 29 and 73 percent, depending on which study they were looking at, uh, of the drugs that they tested was placebo effect. And one of the most interesting ones was the medications for pain. And so they basically had you no know, aspirin, and then they would have had some, um, uh, they would have gone up to uh, codeine, then they would have gone up to Percocet, you know, Percodan, morphine, you know, well, you know, stronger and stronger and stronger opiates. Okay? So if they, if they told the person that what they were receiving was an aspirin, they would have an aspirin-type pain response. If they told them that it was a, a you know, morphine, they would have a morphine-like pain response, even if it was a placebo. Okay, but they went further and checked it the other way. If I give you morphine, real morphine, and tell you it's an aspirin, what will happen? Well, they discovered that in a significant number of these cases, Giving them physical morphine and telling them it was aspirin got an aspirin response. So it overrode the morphine and allowed the pain to continue. So, so like, you know, the conclusions of the study, and this, like I said, this is a massive study. It's got like, I can't even remember how many, you know, entries in the bibliography. It's huge. Um, and so, yes, placebo effect is hypnosis and expectancy sets and all of these other things that that the psychology profession is still exploring, still trying to understand, because we really don't understand it. So the body itself changed the chemicals? Yeah. 
or changed its response to the chemical to fit the expectation. Okay, which which was surprising. You would think that that would not be the case, uh, but in, in a statistically significant number of subjects, that's exactly what happened. And so it's uh, you know, and more more um, capitalizing on that, the um, uh, the pharmaceutical industry instituted a a, uh, a standard procedure a protocol for testing new psychoactive compounds of a double-blind, placebo-controlled study. All right, so you have a double-blind, which means nobody knows what really is going on. Okay, that's all prepared outside of the experimental setting. So neither the subject nor the experimenter knows what they're actually getting. And it's placebo-controlled, which means that they're either getting a placebo or the actual active compound. So theoretically, this should provide a pretty good indication of what is good and what is, what is just placebo effect. If it's statistically bigger effect than the placebo is, then you know you've got a compound that actually does something. However, because of the way that the body perceives things, the placebos are typically inert. They don't do anything. So, the body can tell the difference between an active compound and an inert placebo. So if you substitute an active placebo, like niacin, which causes a flushing effect, mm -hmm. then it skews all the results. Because the body can no longer tell the difference between this active placebo and, a, and an active compound. So now what you've got to do to actually come up with a real conclusive proof that this compound is in fact effective you have to have a, a double blind four, uh, four, four prong trial, okay? With an inactive, with an active, with the real thing, and, and, and so on and so forth, before you can actually come up with something. So our avatar is very, very Very smart. smart. Like I said, extremely smart. Way smarter than we are, as far as this place goes. I mean, it is this place. It is composed of this place's materials, and its nervous system is locked into everything that happens out there. I mean, it knows what's going on out there. We only get a smattering of estimates, and these are like really rough estimates, and don't trust them, but the scale is probably pretty accurate. Um, roughly 2 million bits of data every second, okay? 450 billion instructions on those 2 million bits of data. And of that, 2,000 bits that are highly organized are actually what we read off of the top up here and organize into our own experience. So the rest of that data is, is here, and we never have access to it. Like blood flow, like, you know, all of those things. It regulates all of that. Regulates blood flow, regulates blood temperature, regulates blood acidity, regulates... Uh, breathing patterns, regulates the heart rate, regulates the nervous system patterns, regulates the acetylcholine levels, regulates the um, uh, other neurotransmitter levels. And there's like, last time I counted, like 173 neurotransmitters that they've identified. Regulates the um, uh, digestion of the food. It does all of these things, a thousand and one things every second of every day that we have no access to. And we will never have access to it because it's happening at a molecular level that we cannot get down to. We just can't. Ours is a very high level, organized field of experience. And the rest of it is locked into the avatar itself and is beyond our reach, beyond our, beyond our perception. Yeah? More babbling. Uh, two things that have interested me about placebos. And one of the first studies was by Beecham in, in the Korean War. Uh -huh where these guys came in with huge holes in their arms and stuff, and they were given morphine or saline and double blind, and they found out two things. One, morphine does work better than saline, and two, saline is damn good in relieving pain. The other aspect of that was that, or a subsequent study shows that placebos don't work with faking, right? and the greater the pain is, the better they work. Yes. And these people are not crazy. No. And if you get one of the shots, <laughs> 
a chalk pill that we're told is morphine, and we go on this for a couple of weeks when we stop, we have indeed narcotic withdrawal symptoms. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Physical withdrawal symptoms. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, cramps, depression. Absolutely. Diarrhea, the whole, yeah. Just exactly like that. I mean, imagine what is going on biochemically inside of this organism every millisecond of every day. I mean, it is so complex. It takes, it takes you know, computer, you know, terabytes of data just to describe one little aspect of this thing, okay, as we reverse engineer it. So very smart, very intelligent, very connected to the real world out the extended world out there. Okay, and we're learning here, and in the meditation class, and in the history of philosophy class, we are learning a little bit more about how to interact with it more intelligently, and how to, um, how to re-establish the proper relationships that really exist, that really obtain. Okay? Any other questions before we, before we stop? Okay. Uh, the last two seminars we've been sort of heavy on theory and not a lot of practice. Next time, what I'll do is I will, the first thing we do is we will run through a, uh, a pain management script. Okay, so just, just you know, put that out as an expectation. When we come in next time, we'll just you know, dim the lights like this, and I will actually guide you through a fairly extensive, complex, uh, you know, uh, uh, stew of all of these hypnotic skills that will help you relieve pain. Okay, and so you... Is that from the listed in the notes, too? Yes, that would be listed, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah I'll provide the actual script. Okay. Okay, and uh, I'm working right now on a on a on an audio version of that script. Uh, I have the original one out there, but it's it's not as high quality as I would like, so I'm going to redo that. Okay, this is the one that I've used. I've used this with people who are terminal. I've used it with people who are cancer sufferers. I've used it with people who are athletes and have been injured. I've used it for people with migraine headaches. Um, it's really effective. And, it, and it's because it's a, it's, it combines a lot of those elements, a lot of the skills, a lot of the skill sets. And we can analyze it if you want to take a look at what it's doing at any given point. But you'll experience it. You'll actually feel it. Okay? And you'll get a good idea for how this process works, and it will help to relieve the pain. Now, out on the, out on the website, there is... There is audio... The audio file that I added here, this one right here, guided relaxation <coughs> exercise for sleep and pain relief. So go ahead and download that, and it is um, less complex than the one we'll be doing next time. But it is very effective for inducing sleep, relieving pain. And so you can talk to yourself and induce yourself to sleep. Yes, absolutely. That would be so good. Yeah. And you can actually you can actually put it out as a post it a suggestion. Yeah. You know, at some at some time in the near you know, sometime within the next half hour or so, this thing will happen and that will trigger the sleep response. Mm -hmm. I've seen it work. Yes, yeah, it, it works very effectively. Yeah, we have incredibly precise top down control over the avatar. We just need to learn how to do that. I mean, it, it is far less complex than learning how to talk, <laughs> all right? Way far less complex than, you know, learning how to walk and do all of the things that we already do naturally. This is just capitalizing on all of those skills we already have, and it's just recognizing the fact that we can talk to the avatar, and, and it will respond. It, I mean, it's ours. It is designed, like I said, custom made just for us. And it has this incredible response profile when we start to ask it to do things. And it will do them. OK, any other questions or comments? No? OK, yeah, so go ahead and you know, take, a, take a look at that one especially, because that one will help. That one will definitely help. I know there are several of you who actually have a lot of pain. You know, and that's, we want to get to the heart of that. And, and then in the remaining seminars, we will actually, like I said, you will know how to do this. You'll, you know, just by learning, by experiencing it, by really analyzing it all, 
And if, if we have to, I'm done with theory, unless there's other things that come up that we need to have a model for. But we'll do the last seminar, the last four, we'll just focus on practice. All right, thank you. Time flies when you're having fun. And yeah. Time flies when you're having fun. Our construction is Yeah. 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 Exactly the same website, and it's all there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you'll be able to. Yeah, you'll definitely be able to moderate it. You'll be able to change it. You'll be able to eliminate it if that's what you want to do. Yeah. Well, I don't remember what it's like. Yeah, exactly. We would not know what to do. All right. Thanks. That's true. You know, I had the experience. I had low back pain. Uh huh. Years, and I had a, an injection. Subsequent ones that I were looking at. They were saying we we know that, that there's you know reductions in blood pressure, there's reductions in, in overall heart rate, there's increases in heart rate variability.